Next, we're going to look at the exploratory data analysis stage. And then keep in mind, what we're really trying to do here is we're stepping through the life cycle, where the first part was the problem formulation. We had a look at human-centered design. The second component then was collecting the data. And now we're at the stage where we have collected the data and we can start exploring what we have in our data set. And this is what brings us to exploratory data analysis, which is actually a concept that is used generally in machine learning. So we're going to have a look at some of the measures and metrics that you record generally as a best practice in machine learning, and then what we can do specifically with respect to bias and identifying bias in your data set. So EDA, which is short for the exploratory data analysis, is an approach to analyze a data set and capture the main characteristics of it. So it's all about finding correlations, finding how many missing values there are, checking the distributions of the data and so forth. And as I just mentioned, this is actually something that's done generally in machine learning, where you want to perform an initial investigation and discover patterns of your data set, maybe spot anomalies or outliers, test some basic hypotheses and check your assumptions. So what is the special part then about responsible ML or responsible AI? Well, we want to identify data collection gaps more specifically to check if maybe one group was indeed oversampled or undersampled. And that can help us inform the next step down the line, which is going to be about feature preparation and detecting of societal and historical bias or just bias in general. So what are some of the descriptive statistics then that we would look at in general machine learning? Well, we have overall statistics such as the number of data points and the number of features. And in fact, you can see here on the slide in the orange box are uh, code examples. So this is Python code and we're using the pandas Python library here to get some high level statistics. We can also deep dive into individual features and this will what is called univariate statistics. And here we need to start distinguishing between the numerical and categorical features, because for numerical features, if we wanted to analyze a full column full of numerical values, well, then we might be interested in where is the center of that column and what's the variance, what's the spread. So here we could look at mean, variance, we could come up with histograms, look at the distribution overall. And we can get this information with data frame or in short df.describe or an histogram of certain features or dot mean, dot var. So all of these things are possible to do for numerical features. And then we have similar code examples for categorical features where once again, we can create a count. But then when we want to look at the most frequent value, we could do things like most and least frequent or the mode the percentage or number of unique values, number of unique categories we have in any given column. And finally, what we can look at is what is called multivariate statistics, where we want to compare or look at more than one feature at the same time. And here we can form what are called correlations. And again, visually, we can look at this in the shape of scatter plots, or we could look at it numerically with the correlation values. And to look a little bit about correlation here, correlation very abstractly and simplified means how strongly pairs of features now are related. And generally correlation can be a good or bad thing depending on which features are correlated. So if we have high feature to feature correlation, so if you have feature X1 and feature X2, and those are highly correlated, and this could be either a positive correlation where both go up at the same time or a negative correlation where one goes up and the other one goes down, that can actually degrade the model performance. Um, if you think about it, the model, we've seen an example earlier of linear regression, where we add all the individual terms. So if there are two features that behave exactly the same, so if one goes up, the other goes up, or one goes up, the other one goes down, that can actually confound the model. So we want to avoid high feature to feature correlation wherever possible, and we can check for correlations with different statistical tests as well. 
And more importantly, when it comes to the domain of responsible AI, we can actually check for hidden proxies. So we have one example here, a proxy example, where zip code does actually show a strong correlation usually with wealth. So if you were to build a model that operates on different geographic regions, well then you would want to ensure that both zip code and wealth are actually omitted from the model potentially. That could be one solution to go about it. But careful here, there are these hidden proxies. So just by deleting one sensitive attribute or one sensitive feature does not mean that you got rid of it in your data set in general, because there could always be a correlation with another feature. So my recommendation here is take all the sensitive attributes that you have in your data set and check for correlation with the other features. On the other hand, if the feature or if any given feature is correlated with the target, that's actually a positive thing because it means that we can actually improve the model performance by including that feature. And once again, this makes sense because it means that the feature does actually have a relationship, either positive or negative, with the target. So there is some sort of information that the feature has that relates back to the target and the thing that we want to learn how to predict. And on this slide now, we have a code example. So if you have feature one and feature two, you could run data frame on the columns that you selected dot core and what you get is this correlation matrix where you have both of the features and then the numerical values that show you how strong the correlation is. So correlation matrices now they measure the linear dependence between features and the correlation values range between minus one which is a negative correlation and plus one for a very high positive correlation. So the closer to zero the less correlated and the closer to the two extremes, plus one and minus one, the higher the correlation. And on the left hand side, you see a feature one, feature two example where there is almost no correlation. So you see here feature one and feature two are correlated with 0.01. And on the right hand side, the right hand correlation matrix, you have feature one and feature two correlated with 0.01. 0.88, so a very strong positive correlation. So depending on whether those features are labels or feature-to-feature -feature correlation, we might want to drop one of the features from the data set because we don't actually gain a lot of additional information from having both the features. And as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of downsides of having correlated features in the data set when it comes to training a model. Another thing that we want to definitely check for in the exploratory data analysis stage is the distribution of the labels, because what we can easily observe is what is called label imbalance, where samples are not equally distributed per class. And on this slide, we have the example of loan approval outcomes, yes or no. So these would be historical records of the bank of how many loans they've approved in the past. And what you can see here is that more loans were denied than were approved. And this is important for two reasons, because first of all, models, as we already mentioned earlier when we talked about sampling, they may not work well for the infrequent class, so the underrepresented class. And models often assume equal distribution of classes. So if you have an imbalance in the labels, that could mean that the model in this case here is going to do a better job at predicting a denied outcome versus the approved outcome. So this is actually what leads to what is called the high accuracy paradox, where if a model works well for the majority class, then it is generally considered accurate. But that's not to do with the model performance itself. It's just a sort of outcome of the distribution or the underlying imbalance of the classes themselves. And then more importantly, we can have stacked on top of the label imbalance uh, additional group imbalance as well, where it might be the case that the different outcomes, the denied and approved, are distributed equally or not equally amongst the two different groups or populations that we have here on this example with A and B, green and yellow. 
So we need to carefully consider the outcomes or the labels per group. So we should definitely plot this as well. And then we'll see in just a moment a measure that can actually help us quantify what we see on this chart. Because generally the visualizations can be very useful to get an initial look at what's happening. But then really we need a number or a measure that we can track to see is it indeed getting better or worse especially if we want to go back and maybe collect more data samples. We need a number that we can go back to to compare if now we have a better representation of the different groups or more specifically a better representation of the outcomes for the different groups in our data set. So what are these measures that we could use to quantify the imbalance? The first metric or measure that I want to introduce is the so-called normalized class imbalance which measures the imbalance in the number of data points. So you can think about a count between two subpopulations A and B. So the definition then is the number of data points in group A or subpopulation A minus the number of data points in group B divided by the total number of data points that we have in our data set. Now assuming that there are only two subpopulations A and B present. And the value that we're going to get by performing this calculation is going to range between minus one and plus one. One meaning that we're heavily skewed towards group A, so we only have examples of group A present in the data set, and in this notation, minus one would refer to only having examples of group B present in the data set. So calculating this measure can then help inform whether or not we need to get additional samples of either group or AB, depending on how far away we are from zero. The second measure that I want to introduce is actually establishing a connection between the label and the groups as well. And it's the so-called difference in proportion of labels, which measures a difference in the fraction of positive outcomes for two subpopulations A and B. So you have the number of positive outcomes for group A divided by the total number of data points we have in group A minus the number of positive outcomes in group B divided by the total number of data points in B. And here again, positive DPL values would indicate that there are more positive outcomes for examples or data points in group A present. So for both of these measures, the closer to zero, the better. So again, why do we need this? Well, normalized class imbalance can help us detect bias in the model if there's not enough data for each class present. And we can then take the action to go and obtain more data examples. The difference in proportion of labels or DPL helps us detect bias in the data set as well and can help maintain pre-training demographic parity. And there are actually many more pre-training metrics that exist and you can have a look at all of them. I'll be sharing a link in the description. So if we then calculate these two measures for our hypothetical sample problem here of denied and approved, we figure out that for this particular visualization that we see, we have a normalized class imbalance value of 0.4 and a difference in proportion of labels of 0.3. So we do definitely observe some imbalance, both in the number of data points that we have for group A and B, and then also in the positive outcomes between A and B, or the fractions of positive outcomes between A and B. So what we would want to do in this instance then is we would want to go and collect additional data points to reduce the normalized class imbalance, and then in regards to the difference in proportion of labels, this might actually be partially an artifact of the historical data that the bank is using. So we would want to double check if the labels are potentially tainted or imprecise. What we can do now is we can have a look at a notebook that actually performs some of this exploratory data analysis. So I'll be having a look at the notebook with you and we will be able to quantify and visualize correlations. And we will also generate some descriptive statistics and then to measure bias or assess the quality of our data set before training the model, we're going to use the two measures that we just had a look at, the CI norm and the DPL value. 
And in this data set that we're going to see, we will have a mix of different data types, so numerical, categorical data, and we actually need to prepare that data first and get everything into numerical format before we can build a model. So there will be another notebook regarding the data prep, which we can also have a look at.